Okay, so, you know, again, I love, I love preaching uh, more than anything, and I, I, I really find it to be very um, convicting for myself in a lot of ways. I, 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 have to, I have to wrestle with a lot of topics. And, and I remember when I was growing up, there was this, man, I, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about my childhood in a lot of ways. When I was a kid, I was the go, go, go kind of kid. I, I was the impatient. Um, I was the all about efficiency and getting things done. To a point where even when I eat my food, even still to this day, I eat so fast that before my wife can even have her first bite, I'm done with my whole meal. And so I remember growing up and I would always get a lot of flack for um, being, being kind of impatient, being too quick and, and just getting things done. And I always rem- would remember um, kind of arguing back and just being like, what's wrong with doing things fast? What's wrong with getting things done real quickly? What, what, why, why is it so important to slow down? Because everyone would tell me, you need to slow down. You think I talk quickly now? You should have, you should have seen me about 10 years ago. Because I could, give, I could give the same sermon someone would give in 30 minutes in about 10 minutes. And I, again, I, I, was, I was like the roadrunner. I would just go so fast all the time. I was go, go, go. And everyone would tell me, I remember it was even in one preaching class, and I was preaching, uh, it, was, it was very early, I was, I was really young, and I remember the pastor, he's like, I love your passion, but you just need to get a little older, because when you get older, you just slow down naturally. You don't have that same kind of energy. There is one thing that I really do wish I could, I could get through. One thing that I wish I could speed up, and I wish I could just get it done quick, and that's the trials, the struggles, the hardships of life. There was this movie called Click with Adam Sandler. And I remember I was so, I, would, I watched this movie like four times. Not because like it was that great of a movie. It was, it was a really good movie. But I remember watching it so many times because in this movie called Click, Adam Sandler's character basically gets this remote from like God. And God gives him this remote and he's able to pause. He's able to fast forward with this remote. He's able to kind of slow things down and he's able to control time with this remote. And what he ends up doing is he begins to fast forward through all of the bad parts of life, all the boring parts, all the frustrating parts, all the sad parts of life. He just ends up fast forwarding it all. And I I like the movie because, um, you know, it was really funny. It was really good. But the message behind it is kind of like we're living this life. You might as well just let it all soak in. Why, why fast forward through all the hardships? There's benefits. There's a benefit. There's a growth process as an individual of going through the trials, the struggles, the arguments, the fights in life. That that's where the growth happens. That's where the journey is. I don't know if you know this, and I've said this a few times, but I live with my family. I live with my parents and I actually live with my little sister. So our house is crazy. Um, our house is insane because there's so many families. And we're one family, but we're all in the same house. And maybe it's because my family, and especially my side, not my wife's side, but my side, we're very passionate people. I don't know if you knew this. But we fight all the time. If you're with someone who's passionate, you should know this. When, like there's a cost to being with someone who's passionate and hot-headed is that you're going to end up fighting and arguing a lot. So what I've learned when it comes to family, you can't avoid it. You end up fighting. You end up having arguments, disagreements. You end up entrenching yourselves in in these castles of opinion, building it up brick by brick, trying your best to have all the facts straight, trying to have all your ducks in a row so that when they come and they attack you with one of their opinions, that you can hide behind your castle and say, your opinion is invalid because I have my opinions and my facts. And it's interesting in a family because it's not as easy as when it's just with a friend. When you're with a friend and they have an opinion that you don't like, you just kind of say, well, I'll see you later. You know, like, I'll I'll just go away. When you're with family and and you're, you're in the same household with them, These opinions just get thrown back and forth, and there's no escape. And what I've begun to learn, and what I'm trying to learn, is during these times of arguments and fights, disagreements, it sounds cliche, but I'm trying to learn to be like Jesus. I'm trying to learn to love. 
trying to learn not to be so entrenched with my opinion or what I think is right and what is wrong. But in those times where even when I have my opinion, I have my, my idea of what, what is true, more importantly, what I want to privilege is how much I love that person, how much I love them in my family, how much I love being in, in relationship with them. So no matter how much you want to fight with me, it's fine. You can fight with me all you want. I love you and I care about you. And I'm, I'm even happy that we can have this terrible time together because we're going to get through it. Today's passage, and I know I'm going to be gone for the next few weeks, but I, I'm going to start a sermon series on the book of James and the book of James is a very misunderstood book. It's a book that, for some people, you love it. This is like, you're like, it's the best book ever because it's about how your works display your faith. And that's right. That's good. It's good. It's great. But there's some people that they read the book of James and they say, wow, this is so backwards. This is so hard to digest. I mean, even when you look at Martin Luther, the guy who started the Protestant Reformation from the Catholic Church, he would read the book of James and he would just be like, man, we need to take this out of the Bible. Like, that's how frustrated he was with it. And so I, I want to go in, into it today, uh, into the text, and I, I, I want to just walk through the text with you. So in James chapter 1, starting from verse 2, and it's, and it's on the screen behind me, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete Lacking in nothing. I don't know about you, but I read that, and the first thing I say is, that's a bunch of crap. And I'm like, I know, I know, it's like, it's, as a pastor, like, how can I say something in the Bible is a bunch of crap? Um, and I, excuse me if there's little children in here. My wife is probably angry that I even said crap in, on the pulpit. But There's a lot of times when you read the Bible, and, and this is why I encourage you to read the Bible, to actually read it, because even as your pastor, there are times I read a passage, and I struggle with it. I fight with it. I want to beat it into the ground because of how, how much it bothers me from the bottom of my soul. And we read this, and, and honestly, probably a lot of you are like, why is he getting so emotional? He's so passionate. Like, he says he's passionate. But I get passionate about even, even short passages like this. But let me, let me go through verse 2 with you again. In verse 2, James chapter 1 says, Count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet, various tri when you meet trials of various kinds. That's not fair. That's not fair to say. What do you mean when I go through trials, when I go through hardships, I should be joyful? That's insensitive. That's pretty messed up. But then I realize, all right, I need to wrestle with this. I need to struggle with this. And I think the reason why it comes across so harsh the first time is because when you say count it all joy, when you think about joy, you think, oh, happy, 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 happy joy. And I'm, I'm just so in, delighted. I'm, I'm excited. I'm enjoyed. And yeah, even that word, enjoy it. So it's like, it, so you hear from other people, you hear from the Bible, you hear from Christians, when you face trials of various kinds, you should enjoy it. I'm sorry, that is not what the text says. And if that is, if that has been our understanding of what this text has, then we are missing out on what joy really is. Joy is not enjoying trials. Because I'm sorry, if you know someone that is going through a trial or a hardship in their life, and you tell them you, you should enjoy this, you are being so hypocritical, so pharisaical, so judgmental, that they need someone to do what Jesus did, and is mourn with them, is cry with them, is to go through the hardships of life. When Lazarus died, Jesus didn't say, Mary Martha, your brother died, so let's just party. Let's enjoy this, that your brother is dead. No. When Mary and Martha told Jesus, my, our brother is dead, Jesus wept with them. This is not saying count it in enjoyments when you, when you face these trials of various kinds. This is count it all joy. 
And this joy, and, I, and many of you are good Christians, so you know what I'm going to say. This joy isn't happiness. This joy is eternal satisfaction. This joy is an unconditional, unconditional security in the Lord. This joy is not enjoyment. This joy is coupled with hope. This joy is coupled with grace. This joy is coupled with mercy. It's knowing no matter what hardships come my way, my relationship with the Lord is set and secure. See, there's a difference. If you go through a trial, if you go through a hardship, it's not to say, I love this. I like getting all of this backlash. I enjoy getting all of, 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 the, of the criticisms and critique. I enjoy all the hardships. I enjoy that. That is not what this is saying. Please do not portray the word of God to be, something, to be saying it's something it's not. What it's saying is that these trials... These trials reflect that despite what hardships you may be going through, that your joy does not rest in the temporary. Your joy does not rest in the earthly things. Your joy rests in heaven. It rests somewhere eternal, somewhere where, where moth and rust cannot destroy and decay, that it is eternally secured. So when you go through these trials, you go in it with a level of energy and a level of passion and a level of steadfastness that you wouldn't be able to have if you lacked this joy. The way I, I see this is family. Is that when you love someone, you love them and you have a relationship with them, there's a point where you're going to say, no matter what happens, I'm, we're going to get through this together. No matter what you've done, no matter what sin you've done against me, no matter what's gone on, is I am going to love you. No matter what. And it's in this that we count joy. Not that we enjoy the conflict, but that we have joy in the relationship. Verse 3, it says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I think truly that this is where it becomes a little easier to understand. Is that these trials come to test us. And this test isn't like a test. It's not like the SATs. It's not like the boards. It's not like something where God is giving you a scantron and, and giving you multiple choices to get right and wrong. I, I think I've, I've even heard Christians talk about being tested by God in such terms. I need to pass this test that God, that God is, is putting me through. I need to pass it. And I, I remember that's how I kind of grew up. Every time something bad would happen, I was like, okay, I need to do the right thing so that God would pass me and I wouldn't fail because if I fail, he'll be disappointed and he'll throw me into the fires of hell. I, I, I really grew up thinking in those terms. I was a very fearful child. This testing is a, is a little bit different. This testing is the kind of test that proves the strength, the integrity, the character, the tensile strength of something. It's like if, if you grab a steel beam and you test its strength, or if you grab even a piece of wood and you're testing its strength, you're not saying, all right, piece of wood, here's a scantron, here's a multiple choice question, would you pass it? You are testing to make sure that it is strong. And what I'm really beginning to understand why these trials of life come is that we have an option. We can choose to test our human ability or we can choose to test the power of the cross. When we go through these trials, you are given an opportunity. Can you fix it yourself? And God will test your ability, your strength your smarts, your intelligence, your finances, your resources, and he will test it. It will be tested. You will see if your bank account can handle that stress test of the trials of life, if your emotional health can handle the trials of life, if your family can handle the trials and tribulations that come to it. And the thing is, some of you in those stress tests have it all under control. You won't snap. 
You won't break. You are strong. Your bank account is big. Your family life is good. So there's no need for the alternate, alternative, which is to rely not on the strength of man, but our faith in Christ. And I, I, I know God wants not for us to have to go through these trials, not for the trial's sake. He wants you to go through these trials so that you can test the power of Jesus. I think a lot of us, again, have this religious spirit and we're like, oh, you know, I never want to test Jesus. I, I never want to put God to the test. That's so evil. That's so wrong. That's not what I, even what I'm trying to say. I'm saying you have a faith in Christ and Christ has gone to the grave and been risen. So this faith that you have should be strong. This faith in Christ, your Savior, the man, the God that you say has saved you from all of your sin, that this relationship should be strong. The only way to test this relationship is when things go not according to plan. That's when you know my Savior lives. That's when you know I need Jesus. It's not during the good times. It's during the bad times. And again, this is, not, this is not to say you should enjoy the bad times. I'm, I'm trying really to drill that in your head. This is not a call that as a Christian you are demanded to enjoy the bad times. This is that when you are going through the bad times, that you are clinging on to Jesus for dear life. Is that he is your only hope. He is your only joy. Personally, when I go through trials... My first reaction is not to cling on to Christ. Truly, my reaction is to cling on to myself, to cling on to my family, to cling on to those that like me, <laughs> that enjoy me, that, that, that aren't annoyed by me. Those are the people I cling on to. What I'm learning is that when trials come, I need to cling on to my faith because it's only Jesus who can bring miracles. I'm sorry, my wife cannot do miracles. My family, my parents can't do miracles. Your bank account can't do miracles. But your Savior can. Verse 4. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This word perfect is, is the word I want to focus on. And I want you to understand what perfection is when the Bible speaks of it. Being perfect in the way the Bible explains it is not about you never making mistakes. Never having to say sorry. That's not being perfect. Being perfect means that you are fully obedient. That you are doing everything the Lord has asked you to do. And that's where perfection is attainable. That's where perfection, as we've tried to emulate Christ, that if being perfect literally just means that you are being fully obedient, that you are being a servant unto God, and that you are a perfect servant and not perfect, it frees us. When we talk about the word complete, it's this idea of, of shalom. And we talked about this. I had a whole series on this idea of shalom. But this idea of being perfect and complete go hand in hand is that God created you. He created me. He didn't create us to be God. He created us to be like Him, to be an image after Him. This doesn't mean that you need to be perfect. It just needs to mean that you obey Him and you listen to Him. You follow His voice. You follow His ways. And as long as you're trying that... You're doing good. You're doing great. There is now no condemnation in you, in Christ Jesus, because it's Jesus who was perfect, who was the one that made no error and made no sin. That call is not on you. You are allowed to make mistakes. I'm allowed to make mistakes and still be a perfect servant and be perfectly obedient I think we, we, we don't say this enough. We demand perfection. I demand perfection from myself. 
I demand it. I demand that I do everything the right way and I do it right the first time. And if I don't, then I need to beat myself up. I need to be guilted and shamed. Something I want to learn more and more is to be quick to apologize. Quick to love. Slow to anger. Slow to blaming. Slow to pointing the finger and instead just go to God and say, God, I'm just trying. I need you to help me. And that truly has been my prayer these past few months. A few weeks ago, I I, I told you my uncle was very sick. A few weeks ago, I told you... um, he had a stroke a while ago, and, and you know, he wasn't doing well, and he was, he's been bedridden for a long time. And my uncle, uh, he's, a, he's a pastor out in California, and, and he was the pastor, the senior pastor of the church where I was growing up. And I, I remember, you know, he was my only, on my dad's side, um, he was my only uncle. My dad has a lot of sisters, and he, he has one brother. And I remember he was, in Korean, I called him Knappa. He's my, he's my big daddy. That's what it means. He's my big dad. And, and my kunapa was, was the pastor, and he was someone I looked up to. And, and even being in ministry, I remember he was, so, he was also so proud of me. He was just like, man, I'm so, I'm so thankful that you're a pastor. And I remember his whole family was just so excited that I was going into ministry. My uncle this morning, this morning passed away. And I, I thank you all for praying uh, for my uncle and, and praying for, for him. And um, it's going to be hard. I think going to a funeral is going to be hard. Going to um, see all of my family and all, all, old, all the old church people that I grew up with, to see them and just deal with that loss. And I, I'm not going to enjoy it. <laughs> I think this is, this is why even the way I'm, I'm speaking to you now um, I'm speaking is because I'm not going to enjoy, you don't enjoy going to a funeral. It's, it's a time of mourning. It's a time of grieving. I, I'm, I'm already trying to process and, and put it together, like what is it going to be like to see him in, in, in the coffin? But I know this, that there is a joy. There is a joy about it because he was a faithful guy. He was, a, he was a servant of the Lord. And, and in, in that, as hard as it is now, his eternal security was not found in his family. His eternal security was not found in his bank account. His eternal security was found in Jesus. And it's in that that this funeral is going to be a celebration. And again, not a celebration that you enjoy, but a celebration giving praise unto God. Life is hard. And I'm not here to say my life is hard, harder than yours. I'm not even saying, I, I, I'm learning. I, again, please bear with me as I grow older and I try to become more mature. I'm even trying to learn to stop complaining so much and stop being so critical and, and just trying just to let things go. Kind of just be more chill and just, and just take things in stride. I'm trying, I'm growing, but as I grow and I learn this, the way that I get to this point of of not being so phased by life is not about going to myself and saying, Jeremy, you just need to stop being so passionate. Jeremy, you need to stop caring so much or stop being involved and invested so much. What I'm learning is that it's not about me being invested in the church or in my family or in my friends. The way that we truly overcome these trials in life is to be invested in the Lord. It's to invest everything into Him. If you really want a pathway out of your trials, a pathway all, out from all of the crazy stuff that goes on in this world and in your lives, all the chaos of that storm, or the chaos of being in a storm that you feel like you're going to get killed and you're going to drown, there is only one solution that will actually bring you joy. And it's not trusting in the boat. It's not trusting in how strong you can swim. The only way that you can have eternal security forever and ever is if you have faith in the cross. If you have faith 
in Jesus, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he died for you so that you would never have to. There's a reason why Jesus was on the cross hanging for the sins of the world, hanging for your sins. He did it so that you don't have to. That should bring you joy. Again, not happiness. When you look at Jesus on the cross, it shouldn't make you happy. That should not be something when you see Jesus hanging on the cross that you're jumping for joy. It's something that should bring you joy internally, deeply, saying, because you hang, I will never have to hang. Because you were pierced, I will never have to be pierced. Because you were rejected by God, I will never be rejected by God. That's joy. So as we move forward as our church, I guarantee you what I'm learning, we're going to go through hardships. We're going to go through trials. We're going to go through things that are really difficult. But I'm saying we're a family. And I'm saying as a family that I'm not even trying to, I'm, I don't want you to rely on me. And I don't want to rely on you. But as a family that we all need to rely on the strength of the cross. Knowing that the cross will never break. The cross will never bend. That we might bend. We might break. But whenever we do, the answer is always to go to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've done. And Lord, I, I thank you that that you can speak to us. So Father, when we encounter various trials, I pray that we would consider it joy. That this joy would produce steadfastness in us and this steadfastness would make us perfect and complete in Christ. Father, I pray for our community. I pray for every family in here, every individual in here, that we would rely not on each other, but we would rely truly on you. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> And truly, we can trade our sorrows. So, Father, I thank you again just for Jesus. I thank you that the cross is stronger, that we are not strong, but you are strong. So I pray for the rest of our lives that we would rely on your strength and not ours. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.